When we are not believers in Jesus Christ, for those who are, are unsaved in this world prior to our salvation and for those who are still not saved, the conscience is a slave to sin. It is a slave to the fallen uh, um, teachings of this world. It's a slave to Satan. It, it is held captive by all of the sin, all of the error, all of the false doctrine. And yet when we are made alive in Jesus Christ, the conscience is still held captive where it should be. But not by sin, not by Satan, not by the fallen things of this world, but held captive by the Word of God. And when we say my conscience is in a sense attached to God's Word, and, and whatever God's Word says, that has a direct impact on how I think and, and how I feel and what I do and, and what I'm comfortable with and what, what lines I won't cross, it's because God's Word will not allow me to go against it. I'm held captive to it. That's what we need to strive for. We're going to uh, continue with part two uh, this morning of our lesson from last week, uh, which is the seared and the sensitive conscience. If you were here with us, uh, you know that we were able to go through the first portion of that, and uh, that was focusing uh, primarily on what we see as the seared conscience, and that's what Paul calls it uh, in the New Testament. And uh, it was a message that we had heard, or, or some of the men had heard. I had preached that at uh, Faithful Men last week, and I uh, just wanted to give it a little more time than uh, we had uh, last week, and so we are doing this in two parts. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the second part, which is the sensitive conscience. But when we talk about the, the, uh, uh, the seared conscience, let me just do a, a brief review here uh, in case you were not here or if you were and you just need that review. Uh, I had mentioned the fact that uh, many people rely on various uh, systems of navigation, uh, whether it's GPS like you see on the screen or it's your phone or, or uh, you know, in, in the past before we had all this technology, it was uh, the map. Uh, maybe you had one of those, or they call the Thompson guides. Is that what it was? Thomas Guide, yeah, see, uh, Thomas Guide. And you had to go and find where it was on the grid and figure out where you were. And some of our first road trips, Monique and I, we had to use the Thomas Guide or grab a map from a gas station and try to figure out where we were. Uh, whether it was uh, the old school paper or it's the new tech, a lot of people will trust the navigation system. And uh, as we also saw last week, there were some uh, failures in those systems. I gave you a few examples where some of the uh, navigational directions led people to situations of danger. And uh, for some people, there were deadly results. Uh, and this is often due to uh, faulty programming or outdated information, uh, sometimes human error. Sometimes the system gives the right information and uh, the user is overlooking the information that is there. But uh, often the, the uh, information systems are going to mislead you. Uh, they're going to take you a direction you don't want to go. Uh, now when we talk about those navigation systems, I also mentioned last week that every person uh, who is created, whether they are a believer or an unbeliever, has, big, has been given one of these navigation systems, in a sense, uh, by God to them. And that is what we call the conscience. And so the conscience, uh, we saw, is a, uh, a kind of a neutral thing. Uh, the conscience itself doesn't determine what is truth and what is error. It doesn't determine what is right and wrong. It takes the information that has been programmed, that has been put into it, uh, the teaching, the knowledge, the wisdom, and it will, will base decisions on that information that has come in. And so when we're talking about that seared conscience, uh, the conscience that is hardened to God, the conscience that has been desensitized, uh, is that way because it has uh, been taking in all of the wrong information, the information of the world, the wisdom of the world, the knowledge of the world. Uh, when we see in Scripture, it takes in false doctrine, false teaching, and as a result, it is a flawed system. And so when people who have those consciences that have not been renewed through salvation, through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, or by the Holy Spirit, and, and having that new life in Christ, and the mind that can conform to the Word of God, well, then there is a conscience that is not going to function in the way that God has designed it to function. And it will lead people on the wrong direction. And we're not talking about a roadmap, but through the course of life. And that is why you see so many people in the world who are calling good evil and evil good, and not just practicing it, but encouraging others uh, to follow and to, uh, to promote that throughout the world. And uh, all of that is part of that seared conscience. You know, and, and the world doesn't accept the things of God. 
Uh, when the world hears uh, uh, terms like God or the Bible or Jesus Christ or Christian or even truth, uh, they will mock at those ideas. Uh, they will mock those who hold those ideas. And as the Bible says, they think that the cross is foolishness. The mention of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the idea that we are saved by the work of Christ on the cross, uh, they see that as foolishness and that uh, we need to abandon those man-made concepts of religion and embrace true knowledge. And uh, that true knowledge is always apart from what God's word says. And so it's not just that people will see what we believe as error, but they also will see it as uh, wicked and filled with hate. And sometimes the main reason for the problems in the world. And so it's not uh, very difficult to see that the world is very hostile to the things of God. And again, that is a product of a seared conscience. That as they look at the word of God and the people who follow God's word, uh, they see that and they look at that and say, that is just ridiculous, uh, that is absurd, we cannot believe in that. They're fables, they are fairy tales, uh, they're mental crutches, and uh, we need to abandon such thinking. Um, and so as we, we look at that in the end, we, we saw that those with a seared conscience, uh, although they feel really good about what they are doing and what they believe, and there are others who are, are cheering them on and who are, are uh, engaging in the same type of activities, uh, in the end, they stand condemned before God. Uh, as we see in, in Scripture, we'll actually see it today, that those who have abandoned sincere faith and they don't have the good conscience, uh, they are shipwrecked in their faith. And uh, when you are in that situation, is a situation of peril. And so we're not talking about physical peril, but spiritual. Uh, that those with these seared consciences, those who have not been renewed, those who do not have faith in Christ, who do not embrace the word of God, they stand condemned before God. And as we finished our message last week, uh, I had mentioned that there is hope. And of course, that hope is only found in Jesus Christ that when a person hears the gospel of Christ and the Holy Spirit does that wonderful work to open their eyes and their hearts, their minds, to regenerate them and they have faith in Christ, uh, they will become new creations, new creatures in Christ Jesus. They will have a new nature, they will have the freedom from sin and the forgiveness of their sins and they will have the adoption as sons of God, children of God, and uh, they will have renewed minds and the conscience is transformed as well. It's not necessarily an immediate thing. We have to learn how to, to put off the old habits and put on the new, and so it will take time uh, to break that uh, pattern of living uh, that we had prior to being saved. And of course, the older you are when you're saved, you have a lot more uh, putting off to do because you have been engaging in the worldly things for much longer than a younger person who comes to Christ but you have everything you need for life and godliness, and that includes everything you need for a seared conscience to become a sensitive conscience. Well, as we look at our lesson for this morning, uh, just as a reminder, we looked at two points last week. Uh, we asked three questions to uh, help us understand the subject of the conscience. Last week, we started with what is the conscience, and then we also looked at what is a seared conscience. Uh, today we're going to tackle just the one question, what is the sensitive conscience? But as we do that, I'm going to present to you uh, seven characteristics of a sensitive conscience. So I'll talk a little bit about what a sensitive conscience is. It'll be a bit of review, because if we talked about what a seared conscience is, we also showed what it is lacking and why it's in that, that situation, that condition. Uh, but we'll talk about that uh, in a bit. What is a sensitive conscience? But we'll look at these characteristics. And as we look at these seven characteristics, you'll see straight from Scripture, as Paul and uh, Peter are, are writing about the conscience, that for those who have a good conscience, those who have a clear conscience before God, those who have that conscience that is sensitive to the things of God, you can expect to see these things, these characteristics in your lives as a product of that seared conscience, as a result, or, or excuse me, the um, sensitive conscience. And, and you'll see these benefits, these blessings, these characteristics in your life. First of all, we'll see that a sensitive conscience allows you to stand confidently before accusers. Okay, those who make accusations against you that are unjustified, you will be able to stand with confidence knowing that they are not true and you are clear before the Lord. You'll also see that a sensitive conscience is directly connected to your obedience to God's word. Uh, that is, we hear the word and we are doers of the word. That is going to demonstrate true faith and that helps to strengthen our conscience before God. We'll also see that a sensitive conscience is aware of and shows deference to others' weaknesses. 
Not everyone's conscience is on the same level. Not every Christian holds the same convictions. Uh, we develop over time as we grow in Christ. And uh, at some point in your Christian life, you might be on the weaker uh, end of that scale. You might be on the stronger end. And we have to be aware that not everyone is on the same page and uh, be sensitive to that. We'll also see that a sensitive conscience is necessary for a ministry of integrity to make sure that those who are engaged in the work of the gospel, whether it is preaching the word from the pulpit, uh, evangelism, working in the nursery, whatever it might be, uh, that we can have ministries of integrity if we have the sensitive conscience. We'll also see that a sensitive conscience goes hand in hand with sincere faith or sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is absolutely necessary for a good conscience before God. And so we'll talk about what that sincere faith looks like and why we need to cling to it uh, and to make sure that we can stand before God with clean hands and pure hearts. We'll also see that it's strengthened by the prayers of the brethren. It is work that we have to do. We have to, to endeavor. We have to try to, to strive to maintain a sensitive conscience. But we need prayer. We need prayers ourselves. We need to pray for others so that we can stand before God uh, with, again, the, the sensitive conscience and uh, to know that our actions, our thoughts are justified before him. And then finally, we'll see that it is essential to endure sufferings and trials. Uh, this will tie in directly to what we were talking about in 1 Peter, uh, as I was teaching through that before I came to the pulpit to teach uh, through Luke and, and this lesson. Uh, and I think it's very appropriate for what we're seeing today in our nation, as we see the increase of opposition, the increase of uh, accusations and persecution. Uh, we need to make sure that we have those sensitive consciences before God so that we can stand firm in situations of suffering and of trial. Well, as we go to the first question, what is a sensitive conscience? Okay, a sensitive conscience is, is residing within the person who's saved by Christ. Okay, a person who has a seared conscience, uh, they are not in line with God's word. And uh, we have seen where many are, are said to have abandoned the faith. They are listening to false teachers. They are teaching false doctrines. And so when we look at that, we would say that those people who have been confronted with their error, they still cling to it. Uh, they, are, they are denying essential doctrines. Uh, they have those seared consciences. They are not right with God. But the sensitive conscience is within the person who has been saved by Christ. The person who has, has embraced Christ as Messiah who has looked at their lives and looked at the world and said that, that, that world is leading me to hell, that, that God has shown me my sin, that, that he has made it very clear that I have offended him and I need to be right with him through Christ. And, and when you embrace that gospel message and you, you trust in Christ as the Messiah, the one who can save you, and, and your trust is the, the word of God, that you look at his word and say it is truth, uh, it is without error from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, and, and whatever it says, it is completely true and applicable for every person in, in any day and any age. It does not change. When you have that mentality, you have the sensitive conscience. And, and then it acts as this internal mechanism. It will either convict you or it will acquit you. If your conscience is in line with God and his word, and you are walking by the Spirit, so you are not carrying out the deeds of the flesh, that then when you are doing something, that is in opposition to God's word, and, and if we're honest, uh, every Christian does. I think if I were to just take a poll here this morning and say, oh, which of you Christians did not sin this week? And if you put your hand up, you would sin again because you would be lying because every one of us has sinned. There's no doubt about that. Right? We, we are not free from sin. Hopefully in our lives, in the way that it should be, is that as we are growing in Christ, our sin is going to decrease uh, the, the desire for the things of the world, the desire for the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of, the li of life, that will decrease. But we're not going to live sin-free, not this side of glory. And so when we cross that line, when we violate God's word, our consciences are going to be pricked. We're going to feel the pain, the sting. We're not going to be comfortable with what we're doing. And at that point, the conscience is working properly. It is telling us, you know what to do, you know what you're doing, and it's not right. You need to do something about this. You need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness. If the sin was against someone else, you need to be reconciled. You need to be restored. You need to make sure that you're right with God. And on the other hand, if you know that what you're doing is right, 
and, and others are bringing accusations or the world is saying it's wrong, you can stand before God and say, my conscience is clear. God's word says this, I am doing this, I make no apologies to anyone. I know that what I'm doing is honoring to God. And so your conscience is that internal mechanism that will convict you or acquit you or acquit you. You know, it is such a blessing to have such a, a mechanism within us, to know that God has prepared us to live in this world and that we don't have to walk around aimlessly and, and to walk around without direction and not know whether or not we are right with God. I think that is one of the, the saddest things that I have seen uh, with family and friends who have a faith other than Christianity, uh, that I have yet to meet one of them where I sit down and talk with him, them and ask them about their beliefs uh, whether it is Catholicism or whether they are atheists or agnostics or, or they're into New Age or whatever it might be, none of them have full assurance that they are right with whatever their concept of God is. They have hope. They, they, they hope that what they're doing is right, but the hope is not strong. It's not the living hope that we see described in Scripture. They just hope that there's more that tips the scales in their favor so that when they die, when they leave this existence, that they, they might be in good standing with whoever that God is, whatever it might be. And there is zero certainty. There is zero assurance. They cannot lay down at night and know that they are right with their creator. The conscience gives us that understanding. It gives us that assurance that as we are living a life in line with God and his word, knowing that we are to walk in a manner that's worthy of the salvation that we have in Christ, that we have been given the Holy Spirit and that we are to, to follow his lead and, and, and his guiding and, and uh, learn from him as he's our counselor and our teacher, that, that when we are living in that manner, we can say, I am a child of God. And I know that even though I'm not perfect, I strive to live for his glory. And, and what I do and how I think, the decisions I make, they are in line with God and his word. And I know that through Christ, I am clear. I am clean. I am right with him. That's one of the benefits of the conscience, and that's all part of this sensitive conscience that we have through salvation in Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking of Martin Luther, and, and uh, maybe you're familiar with him. Uh, when you think of the Reformation uh, that happened uh, in the church back in the 1500s, and uh, when Luther, who was, by the way, he was a Catholic monk and a professor, and he was uh, uh, learning truth as he was reading through Scripture, uh, specifically through the book of Romans, and he was reading that the just shall live by faith. And as he weighed what Scripture said and he looked at what the Catholic Church was teaching, uh, and, and as the Catholic Church was really a system of, of justification by works, and he was evaluating what was going on in the church, the indulgences, and, and selling, basically selling pardons to people uh, for money to, to fund the Catholic projects, uh, Luther started to write against those things. And he wanted to see reform within the church. He wanted to see the, the, the church leaders, he wanted to see the Catholic Church open up the scriptures and trust the word of God alone. And, and yet they wouldn't do that. And so they called him uh, to give an answer for his actions. They actually called him to, to give him this ultimatum. You need to stop teaching these things. You need to stop spreading these lies. You need to recant. You need to abandon these teachings. It was basically abandon them or else. And as he was standing there before what is called the Diet of Worms, he says, unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I cannot recant. For my conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. As he's standing before his accusers, he says, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. I cannot deny these doctrines. I cannot deny scripture because I know it's the word of God. My conscience simply will not allow me to do that. If I act against my conscience and my conscience is based on the teachings of God's word, that's a dangerous place to be. That's a dangerous decision to make. Whatever you are going to, to accuse me of, whatever you are going to, to do to me, whatever threats you make, I cannot abandon these teachings. I will not stop proclaiming this truth. I simply am not comfortable doing that. I cannot be because my conscience tells me that is wrong. You see, that's the kind of conviction that we need to have. And, and, and I think one of the keys here, and when you look at this quote, is, is my conscience is held captive by the word of God. 
When we are not believers in Jesus Christ, for those who are, are unsaved in this world prior to our salvation and for those who are still not saved, the conscience is a slave to sin. It is a slave to the fallen uh, um, teachings of this world. It's a slave to Satan. It, it is held captive by all of the sin, all of the error, all of the false doctrine. And yet when we are made alive in Jesus Christ, the conscience is still held captive where it should be. But not by sin, not by Satan, not by the fallen things of this world, but held captive by the word of God. And when we say my conscience is in a sense attached to God's word, and, and whatever God's word says, that has a direct impact on how I think and, and how I feel and what I do and, and what I'm comfortable with and what, what lines I won't cross, it's because God's word will not allow me to go against it. I'm held captive to it. That's what we need to strive for. We want to make sure that our, our, our hearts, our minds, our lives are so in tune with God's word that when error presents itself, we say, that is wrong. I cannot cross that line. You know, a number of years ago, I was teaching a class uh, for a homeschool group, and it was a class on uh, apologetics. It was to uh, junior high and high schoolers. And as we were going through um, the study, uh, we did survey other religions. You know, they were interested in looking at what, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and, you know, how they compare to Christianity. And so we spent the semester looking at that. And uh, one student asked, well, well, how much time should I invest in studying about these other religions? And that's a good question. So do I need to know when they were founded and who this person was and who their leaders are and how many people they have in membership and all? Do I need to know all of these things in order to stand and, and give them truth? And the answer that I gave to them was this. If you didn't know anything about their history, but you knew the word of God well, that when they present something that is not in line with God's word, you would know it's false. There's absolutely nothing wrong with, with uh, studying you know, the religions of the world. It is helpful to know what they believe. It is helpful to know what they teach and, and the publications they use and where they are in opposition to God's word. But listen, we need to be more in tune with God's word than we are the things in the world. Because if we're in tune with God's word and we look at everything in life through the lens of scripture, then when something in this world presents itself that doesn't line up with God's word, we will immediately know there is something wrong with that worldview. There is something wrong with that teaching, with that philosophy, with that mentality. And I have to go and check that with Scripture. And so we need to make sure Scripture is our primary source of information. And we look at it and say it is authoritative, it is infallible, it is inerrant, it is perfect, it is divine. It, it, is, it is timeless, objective truth. This is what I need to know, and my conscience needs to be programmed by God's word. And when it is, I will not cave in to those who are asking me to compromise my views because God's word simply will not allow me to do that. You know, Charles Spurgeon said that a healthy conscience is as tender as a raw wound which fears a touch. And um, I know uh, Pastor Scott has been kind of walking around. He's got some back issues, and you've seen me with some back issues, and some of you know that my, my hand is kind of messed up right now, and um, I'm not wearing that big bulky brace. It doesn't go with the coat, and so I don't wear that uh, when I'm preaching, but uh, it's very sensitive right here. It's amazing. This, this tiny little sheath in here with these tendons that uh, just touching it sometimes or, or just pushing my hand, my thumb a certain way, it just flares up the pain. It's like stabbing needles or knives right in that spot. And so because of that, it's been bothering me um, when I'm around something or someone comes by to, you know, gets a little close, I kind of find myself doing this. I I'm kind of pulling it back. Even before anyone makes contact. Why? It's because I know the pain that's going to come if it gets hit. It gets bumped the wrong way or I move it the wrong way. It's going to flare up. And so I'm aware of those things that cause it to flare up and I just pull it back. I make sure that I don't get around those things. Before I had my back surgery, it was like that with my back. Moving in a certain direction, moving my leg a certain way, sitting in a certain position, it would really mess me up. So I avoided them because I knew what was coming if I didn't. 
if I engaged in that activity, if I made this movement, you know, then it was going to plague me. It wouldn't be worth taking the risk that it might not bother me. I just stayed clear from it. And, and, so when, and I'm sure you've had situations like that as well, where you say, I don't want to get near that. I don't want to do that. It's going to cause me pain. Now, physically, we are aware of that, but spiritually, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of the fact that if we are getting too close to things in this world, if we are embracing the things of this world, it is going to cause pain. It is going to lead us down the wrong path, and a conscience that is in line with God's word is going to detect those things. And it's going to be that warning signal that says you don't want to cross that line. You don't want to get too close to that. It's going to end up in trouble. It's going to cause you grief. It's going to dishonor God. It's going to cause you or someone else to stumble. So avoid it. Run like the plague. And stay away from it. Get out of there as quickly as you can. Just avoid it. And that's what Spurgeon is saying. That that healthy conscience is so tender, it fears touch. Well, let's look at the seven characteristics with the rest of our time, and we're going to move through these quickly. I haven't put the verses on screen. I'll simply refer to them, and uh, if you want to look them up, please do. Uh, the first one here we see is a seven, uh, the seven characteristics, is a seven, um, sorry, a sensitive conscience allows you to stand confidently before accusers. I have two passages in the book of Acts here. Both of them are Paul when he's standing uh, before accusers. Acts chapter 23 verse 1 in Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Uh, In 23, 1, Paul was standing before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and a priest named Ananias. And he's he's standing there and he's, he's looking intently at the council, the council that is assembled there. They are standing against Paul. They're making accusations. And Paul says this. Paul says, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. All the accusations they are making, all the false things they are saying about him, Paul says, my conscience is clear. My conscience is good. Up until this very day, I have a good conscience before God. What you were saying is not true. It doesn't really bother me because I know what the truth is. And God knows what the truth is. So I stand with a perfectly good conscience. In Acts 24, we see that Paul is standing before a man named Felix. And he says, in view of this, I do also my best, or I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before both God and before men. And so again, he's standing there, he's on trial, and he's he's saying, look, I work at this. I make sure that my conscience is right before God and right before you. And so everything that has been said, the counsel before and standing before you today, again, my conscience is clear. Why? Because I strive to maintain a good conscience, a blameless conscience. So that way, no matter what you say, God knows the truth. I know the truth. And I stand before you with no shame, no guilt, no remorse. I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't taught anything wrong because I'm following the word of God. You know, as he was before his accusers and they were were scrutinizing him and looking for reasons to condemn him, it didn't bother him. Kind of like a duck that's, you know, floating around on a pond or in a a lake. The water just kind of beads off. I mean, they are there sitting in a pool of water and you look at their feathers completely dry. It just rolls right off. Listen, when you have a clear conscience, people can attack you, they can accuse you, They can insult you. They can question your integrity. They can question your motives. It just rolls right off because you say, it's not true. What you are saying is a lie. You're misinformed or or you're you're spreading, you know, you're bearing false witness. Whatever it is that they're doing, if you know that it's not true, you stand before them and God and say, my conscience is clear. This was the case with Paul. But he had to work hard at this. As I mentioned earlier, you're, you're not saved, and at the moment that you're saved, you don't, you don't have all the knowledge that you need as a Christian. The moment you're saved, you don't know the 66 books of the Bible in order. It took time for the children to learn that. It takes time for us to learn that. It takes time for us to learn the doctrines of, of, of our faith. It takes time for us to understand and to study and to learn 
Well, it takes time for the conscience to grow and to develop and to become more and more sensitive with God's word. And it takes maintenance. We have to make sure that we are working to maintain that sensitive conscience. It takes effort. Studying the word of God, living by the word of God, walking by the spirit. It's all part of the sanctification process, part of our spiritual growth. And it requires maintenance every single day. Uh, And so when you are working hard at maintaining that healthy conscience, the hard work pays off because you can stand again before those accusers and say, I am clean before God. My conscience is clear. So we want to make sure that we practice that, that, that maintenance of the conscience because the accusations will come. If you haven't had people accusing you or attacking you yet, you will. I mean, in our country, we see it every day. It's growing, the hatred, the opposition, you know, the, the lies about God and his people. And, and our nation is just swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. It's not going to be long before we are public enemy number one. And people are going to say some downright nasty things about the people of God. But we can stand before them and say, we have blameless consciences no matter what you say. When you look at the second characteristic, it is a sensitive conscience is directly connected to your obedience to God's word. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 5. It says, Therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. In this passage, Paul is explaining to his brethren that, that, that to be in subjection to the authorities, to the government that God established, has a twofold purpose. He says, yes, government has been established by God. You need to be in submission. Why? He said, here's two reasons. One, you avoid the wrath. You avoid the consequence of rebelling against the established authorities. If you submit, you're not going to pay the price. At least that's the way it normally works. The laws that are established and and you are following that, well, you're not going to be in trouble with the government normally. Says, uh, and then he says that you do this also to, to avoid being condemned by your conscience. Okay? And so as you, as you are, are being in submission, you're not only avoiding the, the human consequence, but internally your conscience is fortified. It is strengthened. And you can say, I know that I have obeyed God's word. God said he established government. God told me to be in subjection to government, and I am doing that. You know, over this past year, there's been a lot of discussion over this particular passage and the churches, not just in our country, but throughout the world. But we've heard it a lot. You know, are we to submit to the government or do we rebel? And I'm not going to get into the differing views within various congregations in our nation because they are different views. I mean, you have some over here and some over here and some are in between. And uh, there's a lot of um, disagreement within the body of Christ when it comes to this passage and the situation in our country right now. But the principle hasn't changed. As long as the governing authorities are not asking us to do something that clearly violates God's word, they are not asking us to sin, then we are to be in submission. And in the context here, we understand that this is the, the government. We're looking at the government of the land. But if we're talking about authority in general, the principle applies. Whether this is your employer at work, whether this is a professor, a teacher at school, whoever it might be, if there is someone who is established as the authority, we need to be in submission to that authority as long as we are not being asked to disobey God's word. And when we look at this, being obedient is an example of our love for Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. When we look at Scripture, we look at all the commandments that God has given, we say these are the commandments of God. We can say that the commandments of Christ, the commandments of the Spirit, because Father, Son, and Spirit, they are God. One God in three persons. So anything that we see in the Word of God that is a command to us, If we obey that, we demonstrate our love for God, our love for the Father, our love for the Son, our love for the Spirit. And again, as long as we are not uh, violating the Word of God, the submission that we offer 
is going to not only strengthen our conscience, but allow us to live with a clear conscience and in most situations avoid the consequence. Now, when we rebel against the authorities because they're asking us to do something that violates God's word, well, there's no guarantee that you're not going to experience consequence, that you're going to be subject to consequence. You might be, but even when you are, your conscience is clear because you obeyed God rather than men. And so we want to make sure that we understand that. Now, as we look at that uh, obedience aspect, we need to understand that Whatever it is that God calls us to do, we do. And we make no apologies for that. Let's look at the third one here. That is, a sensitive conscience is aware of and shows deference to others' weaknesses. These passages in 1 Corinthians, take a look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to look at verses 7 and 10 and 12. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. So just here for the context, what's being discussed here is the issue of food. Eating food that... Uh, is at times, or at times, was sacrificed to idols. And there were people who had issues with that. And there were people who didn't, Christians. There were some who said, I can eat this, it's no problem. And others who said, I can't eat that because that is unclean. It's been offered in temples. It's been offered to idols. And Paul says, listen, well, ultimately what he says is, it's not what goes in that defiles you. That's what Jesus said, and that's kind of what Paul is saying here. That if your conscience doesn't convict you, you can eat. But for, their, for those who don't help hold that view, you, you need to be aware of that. You need to be sensitive. Let's see what it says. 1 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. For if someone sees you who have the knowledge dining in an idol's temple... Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 27 through 29. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone asks you, or but if anyone says to you, this meat is sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. And for conscience sake, I mean not your own conscience, but for the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? So when we look at all of that, there's a lot to discuss, and we don't have time for that, but the point Paul was making is this, is that certain foods are seen in different ways by different people, by Christians. And if you are offered food that is or has been, or will be sacrificed to idols. You're not participating in that. You know that's not why you're consuming it. Your conscience is clear, you can eat. But there might be someone, a brother or sister in Christ, who sees that, and they say, I can't participate. I can't do that. He says, well, and in that situation, for conscience sake, not for yours, but for theirs, do not eat it. So the principle here is this. We're talking about Christian liberty. We're talking about those things that we can do with a clear conscience before God and say this is, inherent, this is not inherently sinful. Some people might use this for sinful activity and some don't. And I can participate in this. I can consume this because what I'm doing, this is not sinful. And if your conscience is clear, then you can go ahead and participate. But when someone doesn't hold that same view, when they're struggling with that, Paul says they are the weaker person. They have the weaker conscience. That doesn't mean that they are, are a lesser Christian. It doesn't mean that they are, are not loved by God equally. It just means that they haven't developed that same conviction. So because of that, don't eat it. Just abstain. So that way you're not causing them grief. You're not causing them to stumble. Now, we don't really have very many issues when it comes to food, not in our day and age. We pretty much eat whatever we want. And when we resume having our potluck lunches on Sundays uh, after our communion service, you'll see that. If you haven't experienced that, you're going to see we have a whole table of all kinds of international delicacies. Like, praise God, we have varieties of food. You know, for us today, uh, it, it could be something like going to the movies. You have some Christians who say, you know what, going to the movies, no problem. 
Others who are like, I'm not going to go. I can't go watch. They're, they're, not, they're not Christian productions. Could be listening to music. Some Christians enjoy music that is not produced by Christian artists. Others only want Christian music. Alcohol could be an issue. You know, that's a big debate within the church. Do you drink it? Do you not? There's a divided position there when it comes to Christianity. I think it's safe that most would say if you're getting drunk, now you're sinning. But just just consuming something, is that sinful? Well, for some Christians, their conscience says yes. I remember a... um, uh, um, situation that one of the professors shared while we were in seminary. He was, uh, I believe they called it uh, like pastor for a day uh, at the church that he was at. And uh, they would go in and sit with pastors who were offering counsel to their their congregants. And uh, he said that during that time that there was a, a girl who called from the congregation, a teenage girl, and she was crying and she was very distraught and said, I need to come in and I need to talk with someone and I've sinned, you know, greatly and, and I, need to, I need to talk with someone today. So she comes in, and they're sitting down together, and they're asking her what she did. And, and, and long story short, she says, I wore makeup. And he's like, you wore makeup? You know, he's thinking this. He's not shaming her there. And he says, well, tell me why you think that's sin. Well, because I know my parents wouldn't like it. And when I went to this sleepover, I put it on. And he says, you know, you have a problem with the conscience. Your parents didn't, you know, they didn't directly prohibit her, forbid her from wearing it, but she knew that they would prefer she didn't. And she went and put it on either way, knowing their views, and she wasn't quite right with it. She wasn't okay with it. I said, look, wearing makeup is not in and of itself sinful, but you violated your conscience. You didn't have that same conviction, and you crossed that line. You see, for her, that was sin. Now, we don't want to put situ- people in situations where they're not quite sure whether they should or should not do something. And so Paul says, when you're aware of this, you need to be sensitive to that. You need to show them deference. You need to lay down your liberties. You need to lay aside what you know you could do for their sake. That shows a conscience that is in line with God's word because it's not only loving his word, it's loving your brethren, loving one another. That my conscience might say, it's okay for me. It gives me the green light. But I also understand that you're not comfortable with it. Therefore, I'm not going to make it an issue. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to make you feel like you're not a- a- as mature or as, as um, you know, well-versed in Scripture as I am or, or you're a weak Christian. No, not at all. If that's your view, that's okay. We'll do something else. We'll eat something else. Or maybe you don't even bring it up. It doesn't even need to be discussed. And so that's the whole point here of what Paul's talking about, is that, that your conscience, if yours is okay, and you know what you're doing is not sin, you can participate. But when you see someone else who's struggling with that, for their sake, lay aside your freedom and think of them. And so a sensitive conscience is aware of, and it shows deference to others' weaknesses. Let's look at the fourth uh, characteristic here. A sensitive conscience is necessary for a ministry of integrity. We'll go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. As you're turning there, you know, Paul, as we saw a few minutes ago, was on trial before uh, Jewish uh, religious leaders, and he was on trial before Roman politicians. Well, he was also on trial, in a sense, before Christians. The church in Corinth, they questioned his integrity. They questioned his motives for ministry. And he had to stand and give a defense of his ministry to the people of God. I mean, if you're going to expect support from anyone, you would expect it from God's people. Well, here, the people in Corinth were attacking Paul. And so Paul had to respond to their accusations. They were saying that this man is is in ministry for selfish reasons. He has ulterior motives. He doesn't really love us. He doesn't really love God. He has his own agenda. You know, he's arrogant, he's proud, he's whatever, he wants to be seen. I mean, they were throwing all kinds of accusations against him. And Paul responded this way. He says in 2 Corinthians 1.12, For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. 
He says, myself and those who minister with me, our conscience is clear. We're not, we're not um, looking at the, the, the fleshy things of the world. We minister according to the grace of God. We minister in holiness and, and in, in sincerity. We have acted properly in the world and especially toward you. And he says, our consciences are the testimony inside of us that says we are not doing what you say we're doing, that we're not in this for the wrong reason. He goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received ministry, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth. uh, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And and so Paul is telling them this. Again, his conscience testified in his defense that he ministered with all integrity, that the accusations were false. Paul's confidence wasn't arrogant boasting. I mean, we've seen that sometimes, and and there are times when you see those who, who say, I am just confident, but what they're really doing is they're boasting about themselves. And there's a difference between being confident and being sinfully arrogant. Paul is saying, I'm not arrogant. I'm not boasting about my own abilities. Everything I do is for the glory of God. Everything I do is for your benefit. It's in Christ. It's it's submission to the Spirit. I'm doing this because of of who God is and and the the ministry I have to you. He says, my conscience is clear. You know, Paul was saying here that he doesn't walk in craftiness. He's not adulterating the word of God. He's not living a life of false faith and hypocrisy. He wasn't practicing secret sins. He didn't have ulterior motives. He says those things were renounced. We've renounced those things. At the point of his conversion, as he was growing in Christ, he said, these are the things of the world. I don't participate in these things. Uh, these, These things are not proper for Christians, and so we conduct ourselves appropriately. And we live and we minister for the glory of God, myself and those who are with me. And so our consciences testify to that fact. You say we're in the ministry for the wrong reasons. But again, God knows and our conscience is clear. We love God and we love you. We do this for the glory of God and your good. And it's a shame that Paul had to defend himself against the attacks of the body of Christ. But sometimes you find that you get more attacks from within than outside the body of Christ. Listen, if you're in ministry, whether you are a pastor, whether you're an elder, a deacon, you're working in the nursery, the the, uh, musicians, audio, video, whatever it is you're doing, there are going to be times when you're not just unappreciated, but sometimes you're attacked. People might talk directly to you and question you. People might talk behind your back and say things about your purpose for being in ministry. Listen, If your conscience, again, is is in line with God's word, it is held captive by the word of God. You're studying it. You're living it. You are obeying it. Again, you are are living according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and walking according to God's word. Then whatever anybody says about your ministry, you have a clear conscience. Now, it doesn't mean that things don't have to be dealt with. People make accusations. We need to make sure we get right, you know, with those who are are bringing those... those, um, false statements and then we follow kind of like the Matthew 18 model and approach someone and see if we can get things right and clear up any confusion but listen you can minister in whatever you're doing missions or evangelism or in the church whatever it is you can minister with integrity when you have that sensitive conscience no matter what anyone says I'm not in this for the money I'm not in this for self-glory I'm not in this for ulterior motives I'm doing this for the glory of God and the good of his people, no matter what anyone says. And that's what we see here with Paul. He was standing firm and confident, and he continued to minister, regardless of what critics, even critics in the church, said about him. We look here at the fifth point. Um, We'll go back here. Fifth one, a sensitive conscience goes hand in hand with a sincere faith. Many people have minimized the importance of, of preaching and teaching and defending sound doctrine. Many have said that doctrine divides, and it does, and it's a good thing when it divides if you have a proper understanding of doctrine and you're not just being arrogant or puffed up because it tells us what is truth and what is error. Listen, there's a danger, though, of neglecting the study of sound doctrine. Paul says this, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 
The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He says, so, so here's our goal of instruction. We've got pure hearts, good consciences, and we have sound doctrine, a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.19, same chapter, just a few verses later. He says, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. He says, we need to keep this faith, we keep the good conscience, but not everyone has done this. Some have rejected the sound teaching, the sound doctrine, the sincere faith. And what happened to them? They were shipwrecked in regard to their faith. 1 Timothy 3, 9, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. When we look at these verses, Paul is demonstrating that, that a sensitive conscience, a clear conscience, a good conscience is committed to sound doctrine. Again, to the study of God's word as, as the Holy Spirit is revealing to us the truth of the word of God and how to apply it, the knowledge and the wisdom, the application of it. You know, the disciples were to hold to this sincere faith. Jesus told them that when he leaves, the Spirit would come and that the Spirit would lead them in all things. He would teach them all things. Well, those things would be not only the teaching of Christ, but whatever God was going to reveal to them in the future as many of them became authors of Scripture. And so Jesus says you need to follow the Holy Spirit. He is your teacher. He is your counselor. He will instruct you, and you cling to those things. And that cycle continues with every disciple until God calls us home to glory. You know, the mystery of faith that Paul is talking about here is a lot of those Old Testament mysteries that have been unveiled in Jesus Christ. The mysteries of salvation, the mysteries of the new covenant, the mysteries of the Messiah. These things in the New Testament after Christ's incarnation, we look at that and say, now it makes sense. Now we see it clearly. The veil's been lifted. And so Paul says we need to cling to these things. And as we hold to this teaching, we hold to this sincere faith, our conscience is clear. It is good. And so the sincere faith is not just having the sound doctrine, but it's also living the sound doctrine. It, it's, it's having the teaching, applying the teaching, and then teaching those doctrines to others. And that is the cycle that we continue there. So we want to make sure that we always are very careful to guard the doctrine and live by it. When we look at the sixth uh, characteristic, we see a sensitive conscience is strengthened by the prayers of the brethren. Hebrews 13, 8, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. The author of, the, of uh, Hebrews here is, is confessing that he and his companions desire to conduct themselves honorably. We've done this, we want to continue to do this, therefore pray for us. Listen, we need that. We need to make sure that we are praying for one another and praying for ourselves and that you are praying for other believers so that we can maintain that conscience that is sensitive to God. Look at Colossians chapter 1. You don't have the reference on screen here, but Colossians 1. When I think of praying for you, and, and uh, I, I covet your prayers, and I'm thankful when you tell me that you're praying for me, uh, this is kind of my go-to passage when I'm praying for the people of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And I take that prayer and I think, Lord, bless the congregation. Bless this family, this individual, and in praying for you for these things. Now, this is not the only prayer. There are many prayers that we find in Scripture, but the point is this, is that we need to be praying for ourselves, praying for one another, that we can maintain those consciences that are clear before the Lord, that we stay in the word of God, that we are walking by the Spirit because we know prayer is powerful, it's effective, it's necessary. And it's one way that we can keep ourselves right before God as we conduct ourselves in an honorable way as we walk in this wicked world. Let's look at this last uh, one here before we close. The sensitive conscience is essential to endure suffering and trials. 
You know, if you were in the classes on First Peter um, a few months ago, uh, you know that the, one of the main themes in First Peter is suffering for Christ. Uh, and, and as we look at this last characteristic this morning, uh, it, it ties in directly to what is said in First Peter. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. And 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. You know, in that first passage, the context there is a master and a slave or a servant context. And what, what is being said here is this. If the master of a servant is being unfair, treating that slave unjustly, and, and that slave is a servant of God, a child of God, and they endure it, they continue to be submissive, but they know that they are being treated unfairly. Well, then for that person, for the sake of conscience, that finds favor because they bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. They endure it. They deal with it. They understand it's not fair. It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable. The, the, the authority, the master is wrong. But because of their faith in Christ, they still fulfill their obligation and they endure the mistreatment. And, and Peter says, this finds favor for the sake of your conscience toward God. You can say, Lord, you know that they are being unfair. You know they're mistreating me. You know they're being abusive, whether it's verbally or physically, whatever it is. But I'm living for your glory. And I'm trying to be the best servant that I can. But it's hard. But I'm going to do it for your glory and for my good conscience. You know, you might have that situation. We don't have this same a uh, situation of master and slave in our country, but it could be a, an employer. And I can't tell you how many times that I've, I've been in counseling sessions and, and someone comes in and says, I've got a situation at work. This coworker, this, this uh, manager, this supervisor, whoever, they're saying this, they're doing this, they're treating me unfairly, they're making these accusations, they're lying about me, what do I do? Take them back to passages like this. Listen, it's unjustified. Okay, here are some things that you might be able to say, you might be able to do, but if it continues, you still have work to, to fulfill. You have an obligation to fulfill. And, and, and you have to honor God in that situation. You, you definitely don't want to act in a, in a manner that's not Christ-like. You don't want to be sinful. You don't want to get revenge. You don't want to retaliate. You're going to have to endure that. You might see that in school. I've read so many articles uh, in, in recent days where teachers are attacking students who don't hold the same convictions that the teacher holds, and they're being publicly humiliated. Whether they're believers or unbelievers, you're seeing just kind of a universal attack. You don't agree with me? Well, then look at you. We're going to make you the target. We're going to shame you. Listen, it happens. But Peter says that you, you bear up under those sorrows. When you are right with God and you have the good conscience, this finds favor when you bear up in that situation. Look at this last example, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. We know that when we go to this passage, it's usually in the context of, of presenting apologetics, the defense of the faith, sharing with others the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so Peter here is saying that, that we are to make this good defense. We are to give an account for the hope that is within us, but we need to be gentle, we need to be reverent, and we need to keep a good conscience. You know, when we defend our faith, it's not always a peaceful and friendly situation. Sometimes it, 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 is, it, it gets a little heated. Sometimes it turns into a debate. Sometimes it turns into a verbal assault, hopefully not coming from a Christian to an unbeliever, but oftentimes the Christian is being verbally attacked when they're making a presentation, a defense of the faith. But it says that we're to be gentle. We're to be reverent. We're not to lash out at those who don't believe what we do. We are to be very gracious and courteous and Christ-like when we're sharing the hope that lies within us. And, and when we live those sanctified lives, when we live in that, in that manner that, that honors God, then that sanctified life counters those attacks. Then those who slander us will be put to shame by our good behavior. 
you know, we're seeing an attack in our country that we've never seen. For two centuries, it's been pretty much Christian friendly, but not anymore. The assaults are increasing, the attacks verbally and, and legally are increasing, and the hostility is growing. And I think in a very short amount of time, you're going to see where the congregations in our country are going to have to take a stand. And if they say yes when the government says no, there's going to be some serious consequence. It's coming. If you have not received it, there is an article or an email that went out from the IFCA home office. I know I have it. Pastor Scott has it. If you'd like to get it, if you don't have it, let us know. We'll send it to you. And there are various examples in there of the way the governments have been rising up against churches or Christians who are proclaiming God's truth, whether it's keeping the doors open for services or it's passing out a track at a rally. People across the world who are standing for Christ are being targeted. And this is increasing. And Peter says, listen, when you have this clear conscience, when you have this right attitude, you're gentle, you're reverent, you're giving the answer for the hope that lies in you. That means you have the sound doctrine, you know how to share your faith. People are going to attack you, and when they do, your conscience is clear. Because when they slander you, you know it's a false accusation. Because your mind is right, your thoughts are right, your motive is right, your attitude is right, your actions are right. And even when they attack you for defending the faith, you can keep a good conscience. We need to make sure that we maintain that because it is essential to endure suffering and trials. So as we wrap up the past two weeks, what have we learned? The conscience is this innate aspect or faculty mechanism within all people which is God-given and essential to self-evaluating one's understanding of right and wrong and motivating one's action or inaction based on one's conviction of what is right or wrong. It's that roadmap. It guides us. It tells us how to live based on the information that it's programmed with. A seared conscience is that ancient and inherent problem in sinful people. It can only be transformed by placing one's faith in the perfect work of Christ. A conscience that is not in line with God's word can never lead you in the right direction. And then the sensitive conscience, as we just saw this morning, it resides within saved people when we embrace and act upon God's word. Just remember what Luther said. My conscience is held captive by the word of God. To act against conscience is neither right nor safe. You know, we need to ask the Lord to help us to have that strong conviction with God's word so that we will never compromise what we know to be true. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this morning and for this opportunity to look at your word. And Father, there was so much to look at this morning, many passages and, and a lot of information to digest, but I pray that we understand this, that, that we can know for sure that we have truth or error and, and that we can be right with you and, and that if we are in line with your word and, and we are clinging to it and, and uh, obeying it, living by it and sharing it, that we can stand before anything and anyone in this world and say that we are right with God. Our consciences are clear. Father, if there's someone here this morning who, who needs to be right with you, that they have been living their entire lives in opposition to your word and, and rejecting Christ and, and, and believing that they can, can somehow merit favor or, or reward or blessing or, or whatever it is that they, they have thought comes after this life on their own, but they see today it has to be through Christ. It cannot be done through human effort and human wisdom that they would just be humble and, and ask you for that salvation and that you would do your wonderful work in them and renew them and give them the assurance of salvation, forgiveness, eternal life, and, and all the wonderful blessings we have in your Son. Father, we pray that we continue to live for your glory and that we will never compromise your truth no matter who accuses us, no matter who threatens us, that we will always stand for your word and for Christ and the proclamation of the gospel and that we do it for your glory and for our growth and to see people come to the saving knowledge of your son. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.